All right, I'm good. You put your hands down. I don't have a really good national Fourth of July sermon to give you this morning to follow all of the great service that we've had. I just want to make sure you didn't have tomatoes or, or rotten fruit. <laughs> But we are going to talk about something that I think is really at the heart of our nation. And that is a subject we're going to start a sermon series this morning entitled Facing Your Giants. You know, when we talk about giants, uh, obviously one of the things that comes to mind is David. When I ask you to think about King David of the Old Testament, you're likely to think of two things immediately. The first is David fighting Goliath, and the second is David with Bathsheba. They're both giants in David's life. One he was able to slay, and the other one slew him. So when we think about our country this morning, and throughout the course of this week, and we think about where we stand as a people, um, we, we, uh, we, we still proclaim that we are one nation under God. And yet we see a people that are in, certain, are in turmoil in the very soul of our nation seems to be crumbling um, in view of our very eyes. And the things that are making our nation to crumble and to fall are the same things that are attacking the people of God's church. And they are the giants that we face. Throughout the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the, the giants that we, that we are facing. And they, they may be physical giants. They may be um, the things that we struggle with and face in our physical bodies, whether it be disease or illness or pain. We're going to be looking at areas where we're going to talk about uh, mental and emotional giants. Holding bitterness, rage, guilt, or shame. We'll be looking at some of our spiritual giants, our battles with pride, <clears throat> doubt, addictions and strongholds, financial giants, and even relationship giants. I want to share a couple things with you that just are, that really just are good news as we begin to, to look at these things that, that we're embattled against. And the first comes from John chapter 16 at verse 33, and it says this. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you, have, you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. We live in a day where there are more people that are struggling with various kinds of, of, of trouble and, and, and strife than any day before us. I've listed for you various kinds of categories that people are, are battling there are people that are just hurting inside and they don't know what to do and there's no one to turn to. So we're turning to modern day psychology. We're turning to popular opinion. Or we're just trying to douse our concerns and our problems in drugs and alcohol or, or, or sexual misconduct. And yet people are not finding a resolve for the soul. They're not finding an answer for, for peace for their heart. And they labor looking for a hope and an answer. And Jesus Christ said, in this world you will have trial and tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. And I'm giving you, I'm promising to you, my peace. In this world, in this land where people are struggling and they're battling and they're hurting, there is one answer to our nation. And that answer is, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who can redeem our hearts and take care of all of the trials and tribulations that we will face. He is the single answer for everyone's trials and tribulation. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, it says, For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But it is the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And though it seems awfully simplistic to say that Jesus is the answer to all of the world's troubles, but it's the truth. Whether it be depression or bitterness or addictions 
or, or sinful behavior, whatever the trial is, whatever the tribulation is, whatever grip Satan has on a person's life, Jesus is the single answer. And it is our faith in Jesus Christ and the power that he has within himself that will help us to overcome all of the trials and tribulations that we face. I'm not saying that there are not true physical injuries or, or diseases that, 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 are, that are a struggle. And I'm not going to promise you in this series that God will heal every single physical woe that you may have. <clears throat> At least not, not yet. But He promises in that kingdom above that every trial and tribulation of, of illness and pain will go away. So we have one that has overcome. I want to promise you to share something else with you. Sometimes we just kind of cave into to the trials of life and we, we don't understand that God has promised something more. And so I want to say to you that God wants something more for you. He wants you to experience abundant life. God has promised that you would have the, the opportunity to have life more fully and more abundantly. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life, and that you have, may have it more abundantly. Our enemy, the devil, has come to do three things. He wants to steal from you your joy in the Lord. He wants to kill the eternal life that God has promised to you. And he wants to destroy you with all of these giants that he's created so that you are so overwhelmed with life, you have no opportunity to look to the Savior. And I'm going to share with you this in, in the course of this day and the weeks to come that if you look at the Savior, the trials will start to start to, start to disappear. You may see them and you may have them around you. Satan may still continue to plague you with the ideas of these trials. But God is going to give you the strength whereby you will be able to walk on straight and narrow paths without the hindrance of having to hurdle these things any further. Jesus came to us that we would have life in him that is more meaningful, more purposeful, and more filled with joy. He came to give to you and I eternal life. We receive this life. We receive the abundance of life. The moment we are baptized into Christ, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those that love Him. Paul's telling us here that God is doing to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond whatever you can imagine. When I speak of abundant life, what I want to, I want, I want to share three things with you. And the first is, is that abundance life, abundant life is about a spiritual abundance and about an abundance that we are given in the Lord. I am not preaching to you today a gospel of prosperity. I'm not going to tell you that if you heed my words and listen to the gospel, that God is going to make you all rich. That's not going to happen. But I can tell you that if you put your hope and faith in Jesus Christ, you will inherit all of the riches of heaven. And God is going to fill your life with spiritual power and spiritual strength and the ability to take a new look at the trials that hold you back, the sins that have been habitual that you've not been able to shed and free yourself from because Satan just keeps placing it on you. God's going to give you the ability to take care of those things and to set them aside and to accept and experience the grace that he has planned for you. The other thing is, is I want you to begin to have a different focus in your life. And that is that the abundant life is, is having a forward, a forward view of life. And we're looking at eternal life. In fact, that we, we look, if you are born again today and you're in, the, in, in this room with us, you are already living an eternal life. You're already living the life that God has given to you and you will never die. We said before that your, your, your body may sleep, but you will never die. You will always be present with the Lord. And then lastly, the Christian life revolves around growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. This teaching tells us that the abundant life is about a continual process of growing, about maturing, about learning and practicing the things of God. And as we grow with Him, as we walk with Him, as we, we learn to do these things, we're going to be experiencing more and more the abundant life God has given to us. But it's also about learning to recover and to adjust 
and to, to heal in times where we have stumbled and fallen. One day we're going to see God face to face and we'll see him as he is and we will be perfected. And this battle will be over and Jesus will complete in you what he has promised. But the problem is for now there are giants that we have to face. In, the, in, day, in 1 Samuel chapter 17 we have the story of David and Goliath. And here we find many keys that we will use to fight the, the giants in our lives. These battles that are raging. The first thing we see that happens in this, in this battle is that the giants are going to come at you on your own turf. When we think about the battle with David and Goliath, Goliath and the other Philistines that were with him, they left Philistia and they came to Judah, and they, they came into the very land of, of the Israelites, and they're standing on, on top of a mountain, and there literally was two mountains. So this is one mountain, and here's another mountain, and the, and the aisle between is, is the Valley of Elah. The mountains were not very far apart, and they weren't very tall, they were, they, but they were in close enough proximity that they could come down the, the hillside a little bit, and they could yell to one another, and they could hear each other. So every day, Goliath would come down the hillside, and he would taunt, and he would tease, and he would harass the people of Israel. Goliath is an uncircumcised Philistine, it says in the scriptures, and his army had invaded the Israelite territory. You need to understand that Satan is going to attack you in your own, on your own turf. Satan is very clever, and his demons are very clever, and they know, they know us very well. Each of us in this room are very different kinds of people. And each of us in this room have our own giants and our own battles that we are facing and that we fight on a regular basis. God is going to work within you to perfect his word and his son so that you are able to conquer the giants in your life. These are not things you must live with. <clears throat> Satan stands before the church today, and he's taunting and teasing the people of God. He's taunting and teasing the church. And just like the people of Israel stood in fear and, they, or, and, and trembled, and they did not approach to attack the Goliath in their day, the church today is kind of standing back and they're letting Satan attack the church and we stand by quietly as, as the church is, is being battered and bruised. Battered and bruised because of the people that are hurting within it. Battered and bruised because the church is no longer speaking up on behalf of the Almighty God on what truth is from His Holy Word anymore. God wants us to take a stand. God wants us to be bold and know that this battle belongs to Him and the victory is already ensured. Where were the people of God on, on, the, on the side of Israel that understood that there wasn't a man among them that was willing to go out into battle against this giant? For 40 days, Goliath came down that mountain and harassed Israel. And for 40 days in a row, the soldiers, the entire army of Israel, were defeated and huddled, huddled up together in, in fear and in trembling, and they had no response. When it comes to you battling the troubles in your life, Satan's going to come at you every single day. You may have days of victory, and then you may have days of failure, but Satan's going to keep harassing you every single day. He's going to push your buttons. He's going to set off the triggers in your life. He's going to do whatever he can so he can defeat you. The last thing Satan wants is for you to believe that God is the answer of your life. The last thing he wants for you to do is to stand in the strength of the Almighty God and proclaim victory. He wants to keep you hurt. He wants to keep you defeated because he wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you and he wants to destroy you. And he's not going to let you go. We have a choice that we can be like the army of Israel and huddle in fear. Or we can make a choice to be more like David that we're going to look at in just a moment. The giants are going to attack on your turf. They're going to taunt and tease you every single day. So we need to get a clear perspective of who our enemy is. We need to get a clear perspective and know who the giant is that we're facing. As I said, the Philistines stood on one mountain and on the other side was the, was the people of Israel. This champion came out, this champion of the Philistines, and he was fighting against Israel. If you don't know the details of, of Goliath, let me share with you. Goliath was nine and a half feet tall. 
There aren't many today that are that tall, but there are a few. Nine and a half feet. He was clothed with what was called scale armor. So it had like little shales on it, um, or, or scales that would, would overlap each other to give him defense. His armor alone weighed 78 pounds. Pick up 78 pounds and put it on your back and try to walk around. I suppose if you're nine and a half feet tall, that's a little easier. He had bronze coverings on his legs to protect his legs, a bronze javelin slung on his shoulders. The shaft of the spear was like a weaver's beam, and just the head of his spear was 19 pounds. Pick up 19 pounds and try to throw it 20 yards into an enemy. It's a lot of weight. Every day he stood and he shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out in your battle array? He said, I defy the ranks of Israel. I defy the God of Israel. Come out and fight. Do not think that our enemy is not saying those very words to you and to our church and to the churches around the world. Our enemy stands up and he defies us. He defies us to stand up and fight. He just stands us defies us to stand up and put on the full armor of God so that we are capable of defending ourselves and protecting ourselves and by the grace of God. This enemy called Goliath, he was rather intimidating. If you compare yourself to your enemy, you're already defeated. If David walked out on that battlefield and he looked at himself, the average warrior in that day taking out Goliath and his brothers was about five foot eight. So you stand out there at five foot eight, and you look up at a soldier that's nine and a half feet tall, and that's, that's your comparison, that's what you're looking at. You can almost understand why Israel stood back in, in defeat, and they worried. We need to look beyond what is, what is obvious. If we compare ourselves to our enemy in this world, if we look at how big Satan is, how powerful he is, if we look at what Satan has done to the people in the world throughout the course of history and how many he has defeated, if we look at the number of churches that have struggled through splits and trials and tribulations and bitterness within the congregation, then we might throw up our hands and say, well, there's really no hope in my world about that. Let's just pray and try to get to heaven. I'm saying to you, there's so much more that God wants for us as his people. God wants us to experience victory. So we need to take our eyes off of the, the enemy that is visible and look at the enemy with a clear perspective. If I look at the enemy from the, from, from the side of God and I realize that I am not going out in my own strength, but I'm going out in the strength of the Lord, let me ask you, how, how powerful is a nine and a half foot giant against the almighty God that created the heavens and the earth? Who wins that battle? God does every time. When you're talking about an enemy that's trying to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you, an angel that has fallen out of heaven by the power and the authority of God, he left there, and he will spend an eternity in a hell that has been prepared for him. When you talk about you waging battle against that enemy, who's going to win that battle if you stand in the name of the Lord every single time? You are. We have a power and authority in Jesus Christ to defeat the enemy. There is nothing that we face that Jesus Christ cannot give you the power to have victory. We've got to take our eyes off of the things that we see in this world and open them to see the things that God has prepared for us. So let's take a look at the battle between David and Goliath. It says in the scripture that David rose early in the morning, he left his flocks, and he went out to visit his brothers as his father had asked him to do. As he approached, he saw the battles of the army of God and the army of of the Philistines on, on each of their mountainsides, and he heard the taunting and the teasing that was happening day after day. It says that David spoke to the men that he was standing with and asked, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And he said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of that man. Your servant, I, will go and fight this Philistine. As soon as David said he was going to go fight the Philistine, a couple things happened. One, his brothers got a little bit irritated, his older brothers. You're going to fight the giants? Little you? Look at us. We're mighty soldiers of Israel. 
Familiarity sometimes uh, loses in translation the authority of God. A prophet is not always accepted in his hometown. The second thing that happened is, well, frankly, Saul was a little concerned that this little shepherd boy was going to go do something that he could not do and all the soldiers that he had arrayed beside him could not do. How are you going to defeat this one? So there was skepticism. There was, there was doubt. And sometimes I'm going to tell you, when you're ready to, to engage in battle and you're going to stand up and you're going to announce that you're going to claim victory in Jesus Christ, there's going to be people that are going to be around you and say, you might as well get up. It's not going to work. I tried that before. There's going to be people that are going to doubt that victory can actually be received. I'm asking you to not listen to the naysayers, but listen to the authority of the Word of God and believe what God can do, as David did. So David said to Saul when he was, when he was trying to demonstrate what God has done in the past, and he says, The Lord has delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. I know that he will deliver me from this Philistine. David was referring to the fact that as he guarded and protected a sheep, that God had given him the ability to actually have hand-to-hand -hand combat with a lion and a bear, and he won both times. So, out comes Goliath. Not only did Goliath have all of his armor that we talked about a moment ago, but he had another guy. He, he had so much armor and so many things that he was ready to do that he actually had a different guy that would walk in front of him that was a shield bearer. So the shield bearer was, it was, he didn't carry his own shield. The shield bearer would walk in front and, and deflect the, the, the enemies or the attacking forces, uh, swords or, or spears. So the sword bearer is walking in front of him. The Philistine looked at David and he had great disdain for him because he was young and small. And he said to David, am I a dog that you have come out to me with sticks and stones and the cur and, and, and Goliath cursed at David. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give, to you, give your flesh this day to the birds of the sky and to the beasts of the field. And listen to David's reply. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. And this day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands. And I will strike you down and remove your head from you. I will give your dead bodies to the army of, the army of Philistines this day, to the birds of the sky, and to the beasts of the earth, so that the whole earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Our battle against our enemy, whether it be mental or emotional distress, physical trials and tribulation, spiritual diseases of sickness and sin, whatever it is that you're facing, the answer is Jesus Christ and He fights the battle. You will not go to war against these things with natural man-made weapons. If it's a physical ailment you face, it is a great blessing that we have the medical services of this nation as we do and as Bob has shared with us just a, a little bit ago. But ultimately, we're all going, we all face death. <clears throat> you realize that the number of sicknesses that exist today did not exist at the beginning of time, that they have developed over time and the world has developed in more in, in greater sicknesses and illnesses. And there's just, it's just going to be that way. When Jesus was on the earth and he killed those that he healed, he could have healed everybody he chose not to. Because he knew that day of healing was going to come in heaven. Our battles belong to the Lord. God does not want us to suffer. God does not want us to, to feel the pains of depression or guilt or to struggle with anger where we're hurting other people. He does not want our world plagued with mental illness and emotional diseases. Our God wants something so much more from us. It is not God's desire that marriages are failing. That children are struggling in dysfunctional homes and not learning that they are loved. That they are not learning to have an appreciation for the authorities that have been placed over them. Our God is not powerless. He is able. He is capable. And He desires to destroy the giants that are defeating you in your life. Our God desires better for us.
When it comes to our troubles and trials, we need to start calling things what it is. In these verses that we just looked at, it says, David called Goliath an uncircumcised Philistine. Why did he say that? Why did he, why did he have to reference that, that this Philistine was an uncircumcised guy? Because there's something at the heart of being in a covenant relationship with God. In those days, it was, it was a matter of circumcision. In these days, it's a matter of the circumcision of the heart that occurs in baptism. He called him an uncircumcised Phil a Philistine, and this is really what he's saying. This guy over here, he's nothing more than an immoral pagan. That's all he is. He is outside of the covenant and the promises of God. He has taunted the armies of the living God, and it's time for him to go. When we talk about our enemy, he's powerful. There's no doubt he's powerful over us. But in comparison to our God, he's nothing but, a, but an uncircumcised Philistine. He's a powerless, immoral, pagan, and evil being that has no presence in the Almighty's presence. He, will, he has already been determined that the devil and his angels are determined to spend an eternity in a place that God has created specifically for them, a place that is known as hell. His end and his defeat has already been secured when Jesus died on the cross and sin and death were done away with. If you want to start to slay the Goliaths in your life, you need to start calling things what they actually are. In our country and around the world, people are starting to rename things simply to make themselves feel good. Let me share it with you a few. A few. Anger. The world calls it having a short fuse. They even tell us that emotionally health, it is emotionally healthy for you to vent your hostilities and your, and your feelings. God's word, however, says that being wrongfully angry toward another person is the same as murdering them, and that we can and must control it. Adultery. The world calls it having a fling, having an affair. They make it sound adventurous and exciting and fun. The Bible calls it sin and shows that it will ruin the lives of those that participate in its devastating effects. It is the way of death, according to Proverbs 7. Homosexuality. The world now calls it being gay, or an alternate lifestyle. The Bible calls it a perversion and an abomination to the Lord God. Amen. It is not sexual preference. It is sin. Abortion. The world covers the atrocity by calling it a pregnancy termination, or being pro-choice. The Bible calls it murder or the shedding of innocent blood. Addictions. The world calls it a disease from which you must recover. The Bible calls it drunkenness. A deed of the flesh from which you must repent. It says it talks to us about self-control. We're, we're appeasing people, making people feel comfortable in their sin. We're making people to feel like there is no hope and it's just the way of life and that's just the way you've got to live it. I'm telling you, these are giants. These are battlefields that God has promised a victory over. And we've got to call it what it is. Whatever the problem, whatever, if you want to conquer it, you, the first step is simply to admit to, to yourself what it is and that God has chosen a better course of action for us, that God wants us to be freed from the burdens of these troubles and sins. So we need to use the things that God has given to us. When David was going to go to war against this giant called Goliath, the first thing Saul did is he took all his armor off and he tried to put it on David, and David was kind of overwhelmed by the weight of all that iron and steel and, and bronze. He couldn't even stand up, much less walk out to the battlefield. And so he took it all off. And as he marched out to the battlefield and he passed by a little creek, he picked up five smooth stones and he had a sling in his hand. Symbolically, I want to share with you five things that you can have in your life that you can pick up and put in the sling of your life where you can defeat your giants. The first stone that you need to pick up in life is you must be saved. You must have the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. There is no power or authority that you will ever have against the enemy if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life. You need to be saved. If you are trying to fight the enemy, if you're fighting battles of addiction, if you're fighting battles of, of mental uh, distress, depression, uh, all kinds of diseases that, that exist in the, medical, uh, the mental health field today, 
There's an answer for you. There is hope for you. There are things that you can learn by the power and the authority of God, but you've got to start by giving your heart and your life to Jesus. It says in 1 Samuel 16 that the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, that Samuel took on the horn of, the, of oil and he anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. Without God's Spirit, we are powerless. We are hopeless, and, there, and we will not be victorious. David was empowered by the Spirit. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. When we go to war against our enemy, it is not by my might, it's not by my power, but it is by the strength of the Almighty God that is in me. The second stone that you can pick up to put into your pouch and, and use against your enemy is to understand the faithfulness and the proven power of, of God. We need to remember what God has already done. I believe if you're a Christian already, you've already experienced God, Satan, God's victory over Satan in many different ways. When you got into the watery grave of Christian baptism, you know that God overcame all of your sin, that he paid the price and he raised you up to be a new man or a new woman in the eyes of the Almighty. So start by just remembering what God has already done for you. And then add to that the history of what God has done through the ages. What God did to, to give David victory. What God did to give Abraham victory. What God did to give the church victory in, in the book of Acts. Look back and, and, and claim the power and the authority of what God has already done in the past. The next stone that you can pick up is a stone of strength that comes from the Word of God. Young David got a great deal of confidence as he sat in the prairies with his sheep. He was had time alone and he was well on God. It was during these times that he wrote some of the Psalms. It's during these times he just learned a great deal about his relationship with God. In Psalm 119 and verse 92 it says, If your law had been my delight, then I would, be, would have perished in my affliction. In Psalm 119, 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my pet meditation all day long. In verse 98, Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. We need to take God's word and cherish it. It is the strength, it is our resource to defeat the enemy. Hear carefully this next psalm that I'm going to read to you. It says this, Fools, because of their rebellious ways, okay, so a fool is, a, is someone that's chosen a path of rebellion, and because of their sin, have become afflicted. The fact that we are plagued with our giants is because sin is in the world. Sin has led to physical, mental, and emotional illness. It causes all of our trials and tribulation. I am not saying that your specific sin yourself would lead to a physical disease, but physical disease is present in the world because sin is in the world. It says then that their soul hated or abhorred all kinds of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. And then they cried out to the Lord for in their time of trouble, and he saved them from their distresses. So because of their rebellion, and because of their sin and going their own way, their lives began to fall into shame, and they stopped eating because they, they no longer had the desire to eat, and they were knocking at the death, uh, death door, not knowing where to turn, and finally they cried out to the Lord and says, the Lord saved them. And listen to the last part of this verse. He sent his word, and he healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. It is on this basis and many others in Scripture that I proclaim to you that you may have healing, regardless of what you're battling, through Jesus Christ and his word. Everything we need for life and godliness, the Scriptures promise, come from us, from our Father that is in heaven. He has given us his word to strengthen us. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, it says, For we, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful. For the destruction of fortresses and strongholds, we are also destroying speculations and every lofty thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive. So many, again, the battle is in the mind for most of us. And that the Word of God says that we can take captive every thought and, and put a, a righteous spiritual spin on it so that we can look at life more clearly and see things more plainly. 
The fourth stone that you can pick up is to, to, to have the establishment of a band of brothers. Sometimes we do need the help of others to stand beside us to help us defeat the giants in our lives. David had, had Jonathan as a special friend that helped him to be strong in the midst of trials and persecution. We must be able to humble ourselves and ask those that God has put into our realm of relationships to stand beside us and to help us defeat the enemies that we have. Galatians chapter 6 says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Philippians 2, 4, do not merely look at your own interest, but also the interest of others. And in 2 Corinthians 1, 4, God comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are suffering afflictions with the same comfort that God has given to us as the God of comfort. I'm telling you what, four times the word comfort appears in this one verse. God has taught you to have comfort in Christ so that you can comfort other people. We need to stand alongside each other. The last thing that you can put in your, in your pouch is to focus on God. David was completely focused on God and giving God the glory and the honor. In verse 37 of 1 Samuel 17, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear will deliver me now. Verse 46, The day of the Lord will I will hand you over, over to me, and the whole world will know that there is a God in heaven. Verse 47, All those who are gathered here will know that it is not by the sword of the spear, but it is through the Lord that we are saved and find victory. When we have giants, the most common thing is to focus on the giant. We keep looking at the problem. We keep looking at the depression. We keep looking at the sin and, and, and the temptation. We keep looking at the things that are battling against us, and we don't see Jesus in the midst of our trials. We need to take our focus off of the trials and put our focus on Jesus. David was able to slay his giant simply because he had a focus on the Lord. David was committed to being God's man and honoring God. Well, what do we do when the giant is too tall and we don't win those battles? This is what happened with David when he went and fought, when he uh, battled with Bathsheba and the temptation of sexual sin. David failed. You know, both times that David was facing a giant, whether it be Goliath or whether it be the temptation of sexual, sexual sin, he ran toward it. When he ran toward the physical giant, Goliath, he ran toward the giant in the strength of the power of God. When he ran towards sin, he ran by his own power and he left God behind. And he failed. So the first thing you need to do is you know the need, you need to know the difference between the war and the battle. You know, a war is a long-lasting fight, and a battle is just one of the one of the fights within the bigger fight. A war is large scale, the battle on the other end is small scale. In David's life, we ask how could David be a man of God? In David's life. He was winning the battle. He lost the war when he gave himself over to Bathsheba and had her husband killed. That's a big war. There's no doubt that's an important battle. But he responded to it in an appropriate and astute way. So what do we do? Let's say today you have you 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 identify the giant, the battles that you're going to face. And you start to do really well, but somewhere down the road you stumble and you fall. You have a battle where you, you, you do it again. And you go to God again. God, I'm sorry. What do we do when we have those moments where, where a battle fails, as David did? We need to repent. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For through the sorrow that you had, according to the will of God, it produces into you a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness is very thing, and godly sorrow has produced in you, to vindicate yourself, make yourself right with God. So very quickly, I've got six things I want to share with you about the concept of repentance. Number one, you just have to acknowledge that you're a sinner. 
You have to acknowledge your sin. Genuine repentance with us starts off with us realizing that we, we are feeble, we are fleshly, and we, we will not be able to battle this alone. We, we are sinners. Number two, you need to have sorrow over your sin. Guilt and sorrow and shame will destroy you if you don't deal with it. But I, I believe full heartedly that, that God wants us to feel sorry for our sins. When Peter preached that first gospel message, it says that the people in response were cut to the heart. If you don't ever feel the pain that your, that your sins caused Jesus, you're not identifying well enough with what your sin is doing. Sin has no cost. We looked at the, the, that video that is very emotional about the cost of freedom. Your sin put Jesus on the cross. How many of you have seen the movie The Passion? It's a movie I'll never watch again. Once was enough to see the torture and the pain that Jesus suffered. But when I sin and when I go to Him in prayer and confess and, and, and strive to repent, I need to feel the pain that I put on Jesus once again so that it makes a difference about my future. If there's no pain, there's, there's no turning, there's no change. So there needs to be a time where we have sorrow over our shame, over our sin. David in Psalm 51 talks about having a broken and a contrite heart. Thirdly, you need to confess your sin. James chapter 1 verse 9 says that we should confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us. Confessing focuses directly on the sin. It admits what we've done. It doesn't hide or conceal it. Fourthly, we need to experience the shame that comes from sin. Fifthly, we need to hate sin. We need to learn to hate sin. God hates sin. We need to hate the idea of what sin does to people. We need to look at people and feel sorry that they are trapped in sin, and we need to do something to, to help them be redeemed in Jesus Christ, and we need not tolerate sin in our own lives. We need to hate sin, and sixthly, we need to turn away from it. This is probably the most difficult, because it means that we're actually going to go through a change. We don't go through the change, it's all worthless. If anger is your problem, let me ask you, will you ever raise your voice again in anger? If lust is a problem, will you ever give opportunity to look again at something that is inappropriate? If gossip is a problem, would you ever again talk about somebody else's flaws just so you can feel accepted and better about yourself? We need to turn from sin. We need to put it away. We need to realize that in Jesus Christ we are no longer slaves to sin, and our minds need to be transformed and renewed. Scripture tells us that to genuinely repent, we must actively turn for the sins that we have committed. If we repent without sincere desire to keep from engaging in that same sin in the future, then we're missing out on what God has promised to us. In Mark chapter 9 it says, If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hell. I'm not asking you to gouge out any eyes today. I am asking you to take sin seriously. Jesus paid a huge price for you to be free in Christ. It caused him a great deal of grief and pain to be separated from his father and to experience death. Give him praise by choosing to live differently. So our victory is in standing in the Lord and we will defeat the giants that are in us. Next week, we're going to look at the, relate, the, the giant of broken relationships. So if you know somebody that has a, a struggling marriage, if you know somebody that is struggling with uh, their relationship with their children, or they're hurt by unfaithful friends, invite them to come and hear God's word on broken relationships. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your son. In him we have the strength to defeat every enemy. It is not your desire that we should be torn up in, in battle with feelings of bitterness, loneliness, and insecurity, feeling unvaluable and unloved. It's not your will for marriages to struggle. It's not your will, Father, that we should be habitually sinning. You have a better plan for us. 
and in our faith through you, we can overcome. So I pray, Father, for victories in the lives of these people and in my life, that we may stand strong and be an example to the world, that the whole world will know that there is one true living God, and he has overcome the enemy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our hymn this morning is just a closer walk. Stand with me as we sing.